Hello and welcome to part two of our Legs Uttered Songs, our sacred art and music in celebration of African-American saints and holy heroes. This time I'd like to talk about Augustine Tolton, one of my more recent uh, heroes and inspirations, saintly inspirations. He's venerable Augustine Tolton, which means he's just one, two steps away from um, full sainthood. And I wanna share some highlights of his story. We don't have time, of course, to get into his whole story. Um, but before we do, I, a gentle reminder that all artwork in this program is copyrighted. So please do not take photos or screenshots of anything. We will tell you at the end where you may uh, have information if you want any reproductions or permissions. Augustus Tolton was born into slavery in 1854 in Missouri. Frederick Douglass, the renowned American freed slave who taught himself to read and became one of the great minds of the 19th century, once said, between the Christianity of this land and the Christianity of Christ, I recognize the widest possible difference. This is such a timely quote because we're still in that state today, aren't we, with all our divis divisiveness and the rampant racism that is an anti-Semitism that is, seems to be assaulting us. Um, this quote is uh, very prophetic on Frederick Douglass's part. And ever since I was a little boy, growing up in Northeast Philly, I've loved Harriet Tubman. I remember getting books out on her in the library. And I'm starting off with her because in 1849 is when Harriet Tubman escaped from slavery. And that very same year, Augustus Tolton's mother, Martha Jane Chisley, was, uh, was moved to Missouri from Kentucky, where she had originally lived. It was the church law in those days that uh, Catholic slave owners had to have their slaves baptized in the Catholic faith and then were responsible for their religious education the rest of their lives. Uh, they couldn't be taught to read, but they could be taught to memorize. And that's what Martha Jane did. She memorized and taught her own children when she had them the Ten Commandments. So here's Martha Jane in our first picture outside her cabin. And in all the images you're going to see today, I've linked them up with music, as I did uh, last week and will in the future sessions. And this one, over my head, I hear music in the air. And it's, uh, there must be uh, a God somewhere, is one of the lines. It's a beautiful song. I hear singing in the air. I hear glory in the air. And in, in this picture, we see Martha Jane with her two little boys and her infant daughter. And it's, a, it's to suggest that she's perhaps getting finally getting uh, inspired with the courage it will take for her to escape from slavery. Augustus was born in 1854, and in 1859, she and his father, Peter Paul Tolton, were married. In this image, we see Martha Jane in bed with her little two little boys and her daughter, and the, the words from the wonderful song, His Eye is on the Sparrow, Let not your hearts be troubled, his tender word I hear, and resting on his goodness, I lose my doubts and fears. Though the path he, through the path he leadeth, but one step I may see, his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. And if you look up on the bedpost, you see sparrows up there, of course, um, and the Holy Spirit is mingling with them. In 1861, the Civil War finally broke out. And Augustus's father, as far as we can tell, we don't know for sure, but uh, his, he apparently joined the Union Army and died in the Army. We're not sure if it was in battle or not, but um, he left Martha with her their three little children. And that's what we see in this picture here, a wonderful song from the period of slavery. It was first published in 1867, Nobody Knows the Trouble I've Seen. And look at the words there, nobody knows my sorrow, nobody knows my trouble. I've seen, but glory, hallelujah, only the slave spirituals could end with such a optimistic note because they knew Jesus, you know, they knew Christ uh, beneath what they were learning from the institutional church. They got the message. And this is why I love them, why they're such inspiration. One story that she shared all her life, Martha Jane, was when she was whipped and savagely beaten by her master, her slave owner. And the worst part of it, she always said, was not the physical torment, but the emotional torment because her master forced her two little boys to watch this happening. They watched in horror, four and five years old, five and six, as their mother was beaten so. Well, this, Augustus shared that story as well later in life, 
and he um, always talked about how that was one of the foundations of his faith in Christ, uh, who teaches us how to suffer, how to embrace our cross, and knowing and trusting that there's a resurrection following. So it became a lifelong story for them to share. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. In this image, we have a quote from Harriet Tubman. Always remember you have within you the strength, the patience, and the passion to reach for the stars to change the world. And here's Martha Jane. What happened? She decided she couldn't take it anymore. And one night at midnight, she left with her three kids and escaped. She got 20 miles away to the Missouri River. And she uh, saw a boat there, never been in a boat in her life, never paddled or an oar, but she got her kids in the boat and she rowed across the Missouri River to Illinois, to the free state. And that's what we see here in 1862, this happened. Martha uh, crossing the River Jordan, right? Or, or uh, the pro heading to the promised land. And on the other side, she encountered a very, a, uh, friendly or at least sympathetic Union soldier who directed her to the town of Quincy uh, and where she was able to settle. And she found a job and Augustus got a job as a little boy working in a tobacco factory. But before that could happen, they were still not out of danger. Even though they had escaped slavery, there were so many bounty hunters and slave catchers on the loose who were paid great deals of money to return slaves to their owners. So she, um, here she is huddling under the bushes at night under a tree for shelter, worrying constantly about these slave catchers. And this is one of my favorite of all the songs. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand. I'm tired, I'm weak, I'm worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. And that's what we see, lead me on to the light. Rescue me from this darkness. Yeah, she's sheltering her three little children inside her great cape like a Madonna. And the Holy Spirit is resting on the branch and comforting her above. Eventually, um, after many years of struggle and marginalization of every kind, Augustus decided he wanted to be a priest and felt the call to be a priest. And, um, but there were seven of the 17 seminaries in the United States, not one would admit them because he was black. So we ended up going to Rome to study. And this is how I envisioned him over in Rome, so far from home. When he said goodbye to his mother, he figured it was probably for good that when he was ordained, he would be sent to Africa as a missionary. And so he's praying and thinking, singing in his head, sometimes I feel like a motherless child. And uh, you can just imagine what that last embrace was like for them when he left uh, from New York and to cross the ocean. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child a long way from home. In Rome, he studied there for six years and never experienced any racism. They didn't have the systemic racism that we still suffer with today in the United States. And he studied with some seminarians from Africa and Latin America and Asia, and it was people from around the universal church studying together and working with each other and uh, praying in Latin. He spoke four languages. Uh, all classes were in Latin. So that's a great mental strain right there that would wear you out at the end of the day, wouldn't it? So here's a black Madonna. He would not have seen a black Madonna, but um, she's uh, wearing the quilts of back home and uh, Ave Maria Grazia Plena. So good Father Gus, as his friends lovingly called him, was ordained in Rome in 1886. And on the day of his ordination, which was the traditional day that priests got their assignments, he fully expected to hear he was going to Africa, but they said, no, the Bishop of Quincy, Illinois, back home, one of them back there needed him to get the, an African-American uh, parish together. Um, and so off he went, he came back to Illinois. His first mass back in Quincy was in a large church and 1500 people showed up, 1000 of whom were white. And they were basically accepting of him. It was the neighboring pastors and priests in the diocese and in the, that area that uh, did not embrace him so well. They were jealous of his popularity, I think largely. And also they didn't like the fact that their parishioners were going to his church and bringing their collection money over there. So the struggles continued and he um, 
had many, many struggles trying to keep things going. Meanwhile, in the national political scene, things were not a whole lot better than they were in the days of slavery. Lynchings were rampant. Um, all kinds of discrimination and abuse was, was going. And that's what we see in this picture here, a lynching with the words from, uh, were you there? Sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. And there are three uh, men hanging uh, to remind us of Calvary as a crucifixion of modern times. So for Augustine, Augustus was tasked with getting this parish off the ground and he in Chicago, he now was transferred to Chicago and uh, they wanted him to set up the first African-American parish that would be called St. Monica's. And he was struggling with the money the people were worshiping in the basement of the church, of the neighboring white, white church as a, they tried to build a new one. And he wrote to Catherine Drexel uh, for money and this is one of the, in his letter he wrote, they're watching every move I make. They watch me just the same as the Pharisees did our Lord. They watched him. And he knew that he was, everybody was watching him extra carefully, especially the other priests and clergy who were, again, were jealous of him and um, didn't want to see him succeed. Between, Catherine Drexel came through and between 1893 and 1923, she sent the, today's equivalent of $1 million to St. Monica's school, and even better sent sisters there to staff and, and be the teachers. So she's the patron saint of philanthropists and racial justice. She was from Philadelphia and um, originally, and this is a picture of her as a young woman when she first encountered the extreme poverty and horrible conditions of the Native American reservations out West. And that's what got her interested in, in helping. So her whole community is dedicated to working with African American and Native American um, uh, people. Her feast day is March 3rd. She died in 1955. St. Catherine, the name of the community she founded is the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament in 1891. And in the course of her life, she founded 145 missions across the United States devoted to African-American and Native American people. 50 of these schools were for African-Americans, including Xavier University in New Orleans in 1917, and 12 schools for Native Americans, largely in, um, in the Southwest and also in, the, in North Dakota, South Dakota. And Montana in that region. After a very tough life, Father Gus finally uh, died during a horrible heat wave in Chicago. He was only 43 years old. He collapsed on the corner of 66 and Ellis Streets, and some passers by were there who helped get him to a hospital um, run by the Sisters of Mercy. And um, his mother and sister were able to be at his side. And when he died that evening, Martha continued to work at St. Monica's after his death, and she uh, worked until 1911, worked, lived until 1911 uh, at the age of 85. She was called Mother Tolton by the parishioners. Everybody loved her and sought her advice and counsel. And this picture has the words of the song, Mary, don't you weep, Martha, don't you moan. And here we see Father Gus flying home to heaven, how fly away, hallelujah, by and by. Um, a great, wonderful, joyful hymn. Uh, that was the, the final song of uh, at Thea Bowman's funeral at her choice. She planned her own funeral. We'll see that next week. And, um, but I love this, like a bird from these prison walls, I'll fly away, which is what all of us long for, right? Strive for. And quickly, before we hear our music today, I want to share with you where the ideas, the inspirations for my images come from the quilts of G's Bend, Alabama, a very remote town of descendants of slaves who make what are considered some of the great modern art of our times. These were people who did not study art history, they didn't know anything about it, but just intuitively and creatively, they were creating magnificent quilts um, that look exactly like the modern art that was going on in Europe and New York and everywhere else. And here they are on postage stamps that the United States Postal Service put out in 2006. And here's a collection of them. Now what they would do, these women would take traditional patterns of quilts, like this one here, the housetop pattern, but put their own personal vibe on it, their own expression, personal expressions. And that's why I love them so much. They didn't stick to the rules. Uh, they very happily broke the rules and, and made something much more expressive and um, enjoyable to look at. 
free from constraint, right? Look at this beautiful quilt here. And Martin Luther King visited Cheese Bend in 1965 to encourage folks to get out to vote and invited them all to his march in Selma. I come over here, he said, to Cheese Bend to tell you, you are somebody. So now we're going to see um, some more images of Stations of the Cross and more quilts from Cheese Bend while Cliff Petty, one of my favorite singers, sings my favorite spiritual, Sometimes I Feel Like a Motherless Child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child along way from home along Thank you. 